Hi, my name is Kira Silvola. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I'm a university. Uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmer is currently a faculty member at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She describes herself as a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She specializes in bryology, lichenology, forest ecology, and is a huge proponent of traditional ecological knowledge. She's the current uh, founder and director of the new Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at ESF. And she's the author of my favorite books, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, and Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. So one of the big reasons um, she's this huge role model to me is the way she talks about the environment. Um, I really adore her writing. It's beautiful. She uses this poet style to also talk about science and ecology and the ways forest ecosystems work um, and the ways we can do better uh, in our ecological practices. Uh, one quote from her book, Bring Sweetgrass, that I really ex feel exemplifies this ethos behind her work um, is this one. Action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So you can understand this kind of method behind her work um, from her background. Uh, she was born in 1953 in upstate New York, and she describes being born a botanist. Uh, she collected seeds and leaves, which I also did, um, and stored them under her bed, uh, something I also did. <laughs> Um, but I really want to focus on uh, how she kind of entered the scientific world as an undergrad at ESF, where she now teaches. Um, this is kind of told through her essay, Asters and Goldenrod, um, and the way she became a biologist. Uh, she says, I wanted to know why certain stems bent easily for baskets and some would break, why the biggest berries grew in the shade, and why they made us medicines, which plants are edible, why those little pink orchids only grow under pines. Not science, my advisor said. I had vacillated between my training as a botanist or as a poet. Since everyone told me I couldn't do both, I'd chosen plants. Um, this is really big to me as a double major in English and plant and microbial biology. Um, I feel that both degrees and both fields of study are essential to my work um, and the work I want to do on environmental narratives um, and decolonizing science. So to see somebody who's had a similar journey of being torn between these two fields that a lot of people say are completely different, um, but seeing this connection here um, is something I really connected with. Uh, so her parents' reconnection with their Potawatomi heritage played a huge role in her understanding in these connections um, to the natural world. So as I mentioned, she went to ESA, she got through it, graduated with a degree in botany, and then earned her master's of botany and a PhD in plant ecology from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, she moved around a bit then and uh, has a lot of hobbies with her daughters, um, including um, clearing up ponds, um, a lot of gardening, um, as well as foraging and things like that. Uh, so as I mentioned, she's really working to redefine ecology. Um, she looks at these uh, methods of traditional ecological knowledge as important on establishing um, a new relationship and a uh, continued relationship with the land, um, one that's sustainable and kind of counteracts against capitalist um, and industrial narratives about the world that we live in. Um, as she says, restoration is imperative for healing the earth, but reciprocity is imperative for long lasting successful restoration. Like other mindful practices, ecological restoration can be viewed as an act of reciprocity in which humans exercise their caregiving responsibility for the ecosystems that sustain them. We restore the land and the land restores us. So again, I'm really focused on this like reciprocal relationship that she describes. Um, I don't believe science is a one way field. I believe we are both impacted the ecosystems we live in and we are impacted by them. So she has a strong background in bryology, the study of mosses and liverworts, lichenology and forest ecology. Her recent work has really been focused on these scientific education methods, um, particularly combining this Western scientific ecological knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge in biological research and education. 
Um, so one of her most recent uh, experimental studies um, was a collaborative study that she participated in, um, or at least the last paper was published in 2012. It's a 23 year long study um, of the Adirondack Mountains and this vegetation composition and how it's changed over time. So they use the point intercept method. So in 1983, they set out these uh, 30 meter transects, um, which are kind of just these two anchor points, um, and then they study along the line in between them. Um, every five centimeters, they'll collect this data on plant species and substrate, um, depending on if there's plants in the area or if there's not. Uh, this results in 600 total data points per site. Uh, through this, they found that the vegetation composition in these areas had changed significantly. There was an overall decrease in bryophytes and lichens and an increase in these vascular plants, which were outcompeting these bryophytes and lichens. Um, they say this is mainly due to climate change, obviously, um, and these kind of changing ecosystems in which these forests um, are existing, <laughs> and as well as the traffic from hikers um, in the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, and again, I really want to focus that she, her main work is on decolonizing science's future. Um, I think one of the most amazing things about her work is that she starts these really small creatures, um, these very small inhabitants of the forest floors um, and logs and decompo decomposing matter. And she can look at that um, and expand it outward into how we talk about the environment, um, the ways in which our world is changing um, and industrialization and climate change has impacted a lot of the ecosystems that we do live in um, and bring that out into a challenging of this Western scientific establishment. Her big work is focused on um, making sure traditional ecological knowledge systems, these very oral systems um, that still go through a process of peer review. They go through these processes of um, observation, collection, experimentation, and control, um, and holding them on equal footing with um, scientific ecological knowledge that's mainly Western, very colonial, very objective in how it views the land. Um, and so this kind of restoration of the relationships we have with the lands we live on um, is a way towards a healthy and sustainable future um, and a way of combating the current climate crisis that I find incredibly important. Um, and she shows us this desperate need to change the narratives that we use in science when we're talking about the world, when we're talking about the ecosystems we live in and the inhabitants in order to reduce harm um, and reduce the impacts of like climate crisis and make sure that we do have this future for everyone. So here are my references. Um, I did look at quite a few of her papers as well as her books, which I really recommend reading. Um, I think every biology student should read her work, um, honestly, because it really expanded my understanding of the world that I live in. Um, and also I just felt incredibly drawn and connected to it. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation on Robin Wall Kimmer. I hope you enjoyed it.